Hello, it's me again. I'm, for those who have forgotten or are seeing this for the first time, I'm Beatrix Groves McDaniel. And I am a, when I'm not doing anything else, I'm a, a teacher. I teach for a variety of organizations, but the one I've been teaching for the longest is the Workers' Educational Association. Um, I've taught for the WBA, as it's often called, since um, 1986. 34 years, coming up to 35 uh, in September. And uh, I've actually been associated with this organization for uh, a few years before that as well. So can't remember precisely how many now after all this time, uh, but I know that I've probably been around the WEA for close to close to 40 years. I'm also one of the national ambassadors for the WEA. Now, the big problem with being so closely associated with an organization like that and having been around it for so long um, and working in a profession such as education is that um, I'm bound by certain professional standards of which one is um, not to be biased in how I teach. Consequently, very often in the process of taking part in a session and, and being the kind of tutor that I am, I haven't really got a chance to talk about my opinions on things. Whenever I give what looks like an opinion, very often I'm speaking from the point of view of some other individual. So if I'm teaching philosopher, philosophy, it'll be from the point of view of a philosopher in particular that I'm talking about. Or if it's history, then from a point of view of a historist, historical character. You don't really get me at all. Um, and in fact, in the process of doing that, it can be very frustrating, I think, for, for many um, um, of my students who, having got involved in the business of the inquiry that philosophy take, brings about, and involved in the whole business of its disciplines and its convoluted nature, find themselves in a situation where they're very much no better off than when they started, to a certain extent. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is, it, is if they thought, or if you thought, well, listening to this, that philosophy was going to give you loads of answers and you were going to end up at the end much better off than you were to start off with in terms of knowing more which would enable you to live a better, more resolved life of one sort or another, then you are probably expecting a bit too much. It was Wittgenstein who once said that philosophy is about this business of a process rather than a product. He believed it, philosophy was an activity, and that's very much my attitude towards it. It's learning philosophy that does not necessarily make you um, any more knowledgeable about the world around you, but it certainly gives you the tools to do to examine it. And I think that can be quite frustrating. It can often end up in a situation where you resolve or analyze or dissect a particular aspect of being a human being in this fraught world of ours, especially at the moment, and end up having more questions than answers at the end of it all. And I suppose if you're a teacher, one of the things that you get really kind of, oh, I don't know, frustrated and unhappy about is not being able to say, look, this is the way things are and this is this is my idea what we might do about it. I can't do that. I can't do that with my teaching hat on at all. It's it's It would be indoctrination and I'm not willing to do that within my, when the work I'm involved in. It's very important, I suppose, at the end that my students get the opportunity using the tool of philosophy to work out the world for themselves. And that process is a fraught and, and annoying and emotionally stressful one and very often unsatisfactory for them if they believed that somehow it was going to be the magic bullet that would change things. It's not a magic bullet, but it can lead to a magic bullet. 
let me put it that way, it can be something that, which can end up giving you a better idea about the way the world might work. So, what this video is about, more than anything else, is a, a chance for me to take my teaching hat off. I've got a hat on. This is not my teaching hat. This is my B. Groves McDaniel hat. This is this hat says, I'm speaking as me. Uh, it's nothing to do with any organization I'm involved in. This is nothing to do with the teaching profession. This is nothing to do with even my wife, who I adore and love. This is coming from my own learning, my own attitudes, my own vision, which has come from 40 odd years of being part of a system and 40 odd years of teaching philosophy and politics and psychology and various other subjects. If it has led to anything, then it's led to what I'm going to tell you about now. But you have to understand this is not me telling you what the gospel is going to be. This is not me saying to you, this is how things, how you should act. It's telling you how I think things are and how things might be resolved. I am, I have to confess, neo-Marxist in my politics. Neo-Marxism came out of the whole business of orthodox Marxism in the period just before and just after World War II uh, from the Frankfurt School. And neo-Marxism by its very definition is not about any kind of orthodoxy. What it tries to do is to use the tools, the materialism, the dialectical analysis, the process of philosophical thought and rationality to strip away some of the assumptions we have about the world around us and produce a kind of clarity which at the end of the day may lead to making better decisions. It doesn't necessarily give us any decisions, it just leads to better ones. Consequently, Neo-Marxism is very much concerned with critique. It is very much concerned with criticizing the world around us and create a kind of situation in which the, the absurdities or the, the, the delusions that, that, that we, we are sort of persuaded into taking on board are part and, part, are part and parcel of reality as we know it, about the world and society as it is, are, are kind of like chiseled off. And what we end up with underneath is a little bit more raw, a little bit more you know, observable. We can then make our own choices about that, about what we want to do about that. I'm going to talk about not only the process, but also what I think should be done about it. Consequently, you probably will disagree greatly with an awful lot of what I'm saying, or you may think a lot of it is impractical, or you may think at the end of the day, I just couldn't be involved with stuff like that. Well, I'm, hang on, hang on a bit. I'm not asking you to do and make any changes. I'm just asking you to listen to what I have to say. And at the end, I'm asking you really to think again about the way the world might work from the point of view of, of the various questions and answers that I'm trying to bring forward here. I believe the world is in a one hell of a state. Uh, we've got ourselves into a fix on a number of different positions, primarily a lack of democracy, a democratic system that's no longer working for us, a set of political figures which are populist in nature, and in the process of doing that, gained ourselves a sense of almost willful ignorance, which we, which passes for politics and passes for rational thinking. This is not a critique of people in the objective sense. This is a critique of people living in the early 21st century that have been fooled to a certain extent. And I often feel sometimes that I have been fooled in the past. And I look back on my youth, I'm now 64, and I look back on my youth, I look back on a certain degree of naivety, when that naivety was I think a necessary phase that I had to go through in order to be able to understand myself as I am now. The process of growing, not necessarily growing up, but certainly growing, didn't mean that I stopped being childlike in the way in which I conceive of myself. You know, my sense of humor is, I've got a sense of humor, right? Like, you know, my tendency not to take things seriously is it's part of that childlike, playful nature that I've got, which I cling on to because I think it's so really important to a human being to have that. 
but beneath it there is a kind of person that that finds the world absurd and uh, difficult to, to to hang on to uh, because of the nature of it all the way in which we've got ourselves into such a fix for instance uh the way in which we have or well, tend to completely ignore global warming as if it didn't exist and uh, the, the sense that it's not we are not responsible at the end of the day for doing anything about it there has to be something done by governments well i I think if you're waiting for governments to clear to solve the problem of global warming, you're probably going to wait a long time. That's just one example of where we are, and I think that's part and parcel of the issue. This sense of uh, abnegation of a, of, a, of a sense of responsibility is probably one of those things. So I'm going to say to you some points that I believe are part and parcel where we can fight that and in which we can actually work to go and say, a better world, not necessarily one that solves every single problem we've got. In fact, it probably may actually give us a whole new set of problems that we didn't have before, but certainly one that, 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 that might help. There are ten points. Uh, I will circulate with this video a, 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 a list of the ten points so you can think about them later on, but there are ten points. The first of these is the need for a grand narrative. The grand narratives were something that were lost at the time of what am I call the fall of of communism and the the end of what's referred to as the Cold War. In the process of doing that, uh, the, the the business of confidence in the great stories that people would tell about the world, the idea of a socialist better future or a, or even a capitalist better future, were lost in a kind of cynicism due to the ever expanding neoliberal attitudes that spread across the world like wildfire after the Soviet Union disappeared. It spread across the world so fast that even countries that previously had or still do have the label of socialist upon them, such as the People's Republic of China, underneath the surface and very sharp, very close to the surface, are in fact just neoliberal nations like everywhere else. It's very hard to find a country in the world that's not neoliberal these days. And the process of doing that, what we've ended up with is a kind of cynicism about the grand narratives of the world. We need those grand narratives. We need those stories of hope. We need a sense of a story about what the world might be like, a better world than the one we got. We don't have to feel embarrassed about wanting the world to be one in which there is a sense of equity. Not necessarily equality, but certainly of equity, in which people gain a certain stake in within society and a sense of purchase about being part of it in which they are recognized as human beings and seen as being an important part of the world around them. That means avoiding the thin politics that's been served us. And what is thin politics? Thin politics is the populist narrative, the three word slogans, the you know, the drain that swamp, build that wall stupidities that are handed out to us as simplistic, analytic, simplistic answers to very, very complicated problems. We need to learn to avoid those thin political statements and refuse to engage with them. The first step is to refuse to be part of that narrative in itself, refuse to be part of that argument, refuse to take part in arguing over the slogans. Instead, we need a much more sophisticated and thick, fat, if you prefer, thicker, more analysed approach to political thinking. We need to take a lot of information and a lot of, of, of sense of, of the world on board. And that means learning. For crying out loud, I can't emphasise how important that is. We need to spend our time learning about the world and learning about its complexity. That means devoting time to that. I really can't see us evolving grand narratives about the way the world might be in the future, which allow us to form a position from which we can build a better future without necessarily having that knowledge. It's a very important aspect of the way in which the world works. So learning is a vast, vastly important thing. As T.H. White once said, you know, learn, you know, find out how the world wags, find out how the world wags and who wags it. And that process, I think, you know, T.H. White was, as it was an author, he wasn't a philosopher or a politician, but he, uh, his 
his picture of the world, I think, is, is one that I'm very much in favour of. So we, we need these grand narratives. Now, they could be evolved versions of the older ones that we've already had in the past, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're all sort of like grand socialist narratives. They may not be. They could be other kinds. But what we need to do is to at least start from position. Secondly, we need to diagnose neoliberalism. Diagnosing neoliberalism means to say we need to look at its practice. Its practice in how it deals with us and fight against those practices. One of the classic things we can do, I mean this is a very simple process, is avoid dealing with corporations. Avoid having a life in which your needs are supplied by corporations. And one in which you avoid buying from them, working with them, having anything to do with them. Put them on the back burner. Put the big boys on the back burner. For instance, I, you, you know I'm going to say this because I've said it so many times before. If you're using a computer right now, stop using Microsoft, Apple and Google software. Use the free open source software because that takes you out of co the corporate pocket. Takes you totally out of it and the process of dealing, doing that, you also do them some damage. You stop them from being all-encompassing. The more people who opt out, the more we don't. They have the more their power diminishes. If neoliberalism is about economics, then our first fight should be to damage, undermine, and take out of out of our lives the corporate interests that are currently part and parcel of the way in which we live. Use local businesses if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to um, buy then buy local. I mean it's pretty much the way what most people want to do because that supports small enterprises, not the huge gigantic ones that dominate us and provide background hegemonic political thinking and influence our lives so much. Be small, and if you're involved in enterprise yourself, stay small. Be devolved. Don't think about big things. Think about the business of your immediate subsistence needs, as you might say, within the business of the, 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 the business that we've got. Your enterprise should be about the whole business of being part and parcel of a world in which there is a sense of, of not being all dominant and the only game on the block. The reason why we have so many problems is because of the power of corporations and the way in which they transnationally govern the lives we have as part of the neoliberal framework. So that's the second point, diagnose neoliberalism. Another thing I often ask people to do, I think it's a really good idea, is avoid buying new. It's <laughs> pretty obvious, really, when you think about it. I'm a great one for second-hand shops. And, but, you know, what the, what the word second-hand shop, you know, the goodwill shop, if you want to call it, in the United States, it's all about the business of recycling. And, uh, you know, if we, we live in a world in which we talk about recycling, we talk about the business of what recycling means, but um, my view is that recycling is something it, which is far more than just making sure our rubbish doesn't end up in the landfill. It's all about the business of, of using uh, 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 the, the things we have around us in a way that extends their lives. So we don't get caught up in the business of always replacing something just because it goes out of fashion. Um, um, to return to computers again, I mean, I, I don't buy new computers. I always buy old ones, and I tart them up and make Good use of them. The machine I'm recording this on is a is a, a MacBook Pro that's eight years old, and I bought for a fraction of the price. Uh, and and I you know buying new is something I do try to avoid. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but when you can avoid it, avoid it. That again hammers away at the idea that somehow the only way we can ever deal with society at large is through this idea of eternal growth. Eternal economic growth is founded on the idea of redundancy amongst objects around us, that eventually they will be have redundancy built into them. Well, I think we should try to avoid that in, in, at all costs. Another issue here is, is to look towards the business of cutting the amount of work we do, while at the same time retaining enough of the income to enable us to be able to continue having lives, maybe not probably the vastly you know, wealthy lives we've probably envisaged having, but certainly having a life that's satisfying and has quality built into it. Cutting the working week, cut our 
that our carbon footprint it cuts our contribution to the whole business of the neoliberal treadmill. If we could cut out of our weekly round of shopping, consuming, working, buying, throwing things in the dustbin, cut one day out. Imagine what that would do for our lives as people. Not only would we have time for all that learning I was talking about earlier on, but also we would have time for things like, you know, being with our families, our friends, dealing with the world around us in a much more quiet and 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 meditative way, I suppose, you know, at the end of the day. So cutting the working week, closing society for one day, shutting things down would cut the amount of power, cut the amount of energy we're using, and so on and so forth. And I don't mean just transferring everything to a shorter working week and working twice as hard. I mean actually physically working less hard than we are. People talk about us being competitive, but competitive against what? Against other neoliberal nations? Against other nations that also think this way and are on the same treadmill, creating the same greenhouse gases, destroying the environment in the same way as we are? Someone, somewhere down the line, has got to think about the business of changing the way society operates. And it's got to start with us, who have got the capacity to be able to do something about it. We also have to start making sure that children have an opportunity to start thinking through the whole business of the way the world works. If we want, for instance, children to have a, an education that's meaningful, we have to start getting away from this idea of instrumentalism with, within schools. That the idea of going to school is to gain a qualification, because gaining a qualification gets us this job to get us back on the treadmill of neoliberalism once again. When surely education should be about learning to be part of a society of equitable individuals, of equals, of, of, of people who have potential to take part in the world with a long happy and satisfying life, not spending our time constantly on the round of looking towards the business of where the next holiday is going to be, where the next job is going to be, where the next ten bucks is going to come from. So we need to teach children how to deal with the world in a much more proactive and, and less instrumentalist and less driven way than we have. And that means, I think, not only re-engaging with them on the basis of business of what a qualification means, that it means about learning things, not getting the certificate. I think that's really important that you know educationalists need to take on board. But also the business of of teaching things like philosophy, like politics, a politics in the terms of how it, what it is to be a citizen in schools instead of things such as religious instruction, for instance, which we've got at the moment, which at the end of the day are a substitute for what we should be teaching, which is this business of what rational thinking means, how to, to deal with the dialectical nature of the world, how to deal with the business of working through problems such as moral and ethical problems and so on and so forth. Philosophy is there as a means to an end. It's not a body of knowledge. It is a discipline. It is a, an activity. Teaching that activity in school gives our children the possibility of having lives which at the end of the day are far more quality driven rather than quantity driven. And I think that is absolutely vital. Now I'm asking educationalists to take this on board and to start thinking in those terms. It has to be done, I think, because without that, some of the earlier things I'm talking about, especially the business of diagnosing and di you know and, and, and and doing something about neoliberalism and this, the state of the world we've got ourselves into, and analysing thin politics and populism, dealing with the business, the polarisation around extremes that have, have come into being within the world, looking at the business of how we value other human beings is a really important aspect of, of all of that. So a lot of what we're talking about here is useless if the next generation is just another bunch of neoliberal treadmill runners. In terms of the practice of government, I think we need to broaden engagement. By broadening engagement, I mean to say we need more people in, the, in governmental systems, in the system itself, in the structure itself, which are not professional, who are not professional politicians and are not there because of the fact that they're politicians. We as people need to take responsibility for the political 
structural systems that operate within the, the nations, the countries, the societies in which we live. That means taking part. If democracy means anything, it is an activity just like any other. We take part in it to make it work, to absolve ourselves of that responsibility to take part and just say, well, all we have to do is vote every four years or whatever, whatever the case may be, or listen to any questions on TV or radio. You know, we think that's what politic politics is. We think politics is something that politicians do. Well, it isn't. It's something we all do by just living in any society. What is the polis? Polis is society itself. To be political is to be alive and be part of a society. You can't avoid it. Much do you might like to. You cannot avoid it. And in the process of taking that on board, we need to be more engaged with politics as a whole. That means not just standing for being a councillor, taking part in your trade union, and so on and so forth, but also pressurising government from, to, to, to create new opportunities for people to take part in the government system. For instance, I'll give you an example. Um, people have been uh, unhappy about the House of Lords for some time, considering it to be unrepresentative. I mean, after all, it's not elected, it's appointed, and some of the people involved in it are kind of like there because they happen to have inherited it from their families. You know, the whole business have been a, a lord. Well, why don't we have a second house? which is based upon sortition. Sortition is a concept that goes back a very long way. In fact, it, it goes back almost all the way to ancient Greece. The sortition being that there is a lottery and or a, a random choice like, like Ernie, you know, the random number generator. And uh, every so often your, 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 your number will come up and you take part in the second. Six in the evening. Six in the evening, yes, I know. Uh, very often you will take, yeah, very often your number will come up and you will gain time off, maybe for a year, from your job at full pay to take part in that second house based on a purely random basis and it should it should be applicable to everybody within who is a voting member of the United Kingdom to take part in that. We could be trained to take part to understand how the physical business of it works. And of course alongside all the other things I've been talking about, about the way in which education should operate, that would enable us as people to be able to go in and take part in a, in a sortitional second house, which would be filtering law developed by our representatives. That will be a direct way of engaging with government and a direct way of us being taken, taken part. You may think, my God, how am I going to take a year off my career? And the answer is, well, you're going to have to for a better world. I would. Provided my job was open to me when I cut back and provided I was on my full pay, I shouldn't see any reason why not. And actually, when you think about it, that would be pretty much a cheaper way of running the House of, what well, the second house, not the House of Lords, than it would be for everybody else, as it is today. Imagine this happening. It's no different, to, I suppose, in some respects, in your responsibilities to take part in jury service. You know, if you get called up for a jury, you have to go and take part. Why not the same thing for a, a second house? That way, there would be no slanting of the second house around rich people, wealthy people, landowners, the appointees, and so on and so forth. It would be purely on a random basis. And we would be trained for it. So, what about other aspects of this? Well, I, I want to see greater local devolution. I am very much in favour, for instance, of a federated United... what is currently the United Kingdom becoming a federated state. In other words, that both you know, the other nations, Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, should be still part of a loose federation of, of nation states, but they should largely be running their own affairs. We are past the business of needing to be constantly in each other's pockets all the time as, as a society. You know, the old idea of history being something we are kind of like overwhelmed by to the extent we can't allow other people to make their, their own decisions based on their cultural needs, their differences, their sense of self. I don't understand why that's not the case. Why are we so reluctant to allow local governments to take greater, greater responsibilities, to have greater power? We need, for instance, I suppose, to have a more Switzerland-like approach to things. I mean, if you, I don't know if anybody knows about Switzerland, but if you've been in Switzerland, you know the local cantonal government is very, very much a powerful part of the Swiss Federation. 
local, the, the, the national government deals with things like, I don't know, organized defense, you know, national policy of, of, of representation abroad and, and stuff of that sort. But it, very few people know exactly who is in charge at any one time. The, the council that runs Switzerland is far less powerful than our parliament is, yet has it, it, a unifying place in the way in which Switzerland sees itself. And you often remember that Switzerland is a, is a nation of four different national identities, the Romansh, the French, the German, and the Italian, and in the process of, of their history. They've learned to live together as a federation where local, local, very, 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 very devolved government plays a vast part. Having government close to society, close to you, means there is more chance, in line with all the other things I've been talking about, more chance of you having a strong influence on what its policies might be in terms of local conditions. After all, your local conditions are what what make you, as a, as a human being, responsible for your local environment, your local productivity, your local you know, quality of life. And I think that's really where things should be happening. Not down in London, but locally. I strongly believe also in disrupting what's referred to as managerialism. Managerialism is the technocratic approach to systems, which comes directly out of the neoliberal concept. Managerialism says that at the end of the day, management directs all activity from a top-down position. Managerialism manages things but doesn't change anything. Managerialism doesn't allow an organization to evolve. It makes it fixed in time and sustains it by continuing practices, even when those, old pra those practices are negative and are seen as being something less than happy in terms of the way in which it's, it's, it, the, you know, the members of that organization operate. Managerialism is hugely harmful to, to organizations, be they public or private, whether they be voluntary organizations or national ones or local ones. Managerialist processes within organizations fail to learn from their mistakes, continue to repeat old habits from an ideological point of view, and evolve very bad practices, which at the end they are harmful to the great bulk of the people who take part in the organization. I've seen this happen time and time again within organizations, and especially so over the past decade to 15 years, as neoliberalism has taken hold globally. You see it in local government, you especially see it in national government, where managerialism has become part and parcel of the way our parliament works. You know, we have situations very often in which policy that could change the, the country for the better never gets to be enacted because managerialist concerns want to sustain the current status quo with all its inequalities, inequities, you know, uh, and, and other issues. And the process of doing that, when you end up with a crisis like the one we're in at the moment, you end up with a situation where managerialism is inefficient in dealing with local processes. It's incapable of doing that. We have, you know, we're supposed to have a track and trace system in place in the UK in order to uh, deal with the coronavirus, tracking who's got it and you know who they've been in contact with, but it's not working. And the reason why is because it was done on a manager, it was implemented on a managerialist basis, based on, well, it was implemented on the business of a top-down approach without taking into account local conditions and local facilities already in place trusting local people and especially local medics, local general practitioners to have a vision of how this might be enacted locally. We need to get away from managerialism. And my argument is whether you be in it whether it be in a trade union, whether it be in a political party, whether it be in a voluntary organization, whether it be in a local government, whether it be in a national government, whether it be in a business, what we have to do is attack managerialism when whenever we find it. We must attack it at its greatest weakness which is its own inefficiency. We must attack it because at the end, its stultifying nature creates many of the problems we're dealing with today and an inability to grow, learn, evolve, and improve the world about us, even when we've got the opportunity to do so. Point, that was point eight. Point nine. What we need also is a return to the idea of valuing the public sphere. The public sphere is something that a... A philosopher by the name of Jürgen Habermas uh, described 
decades ago, actually. He described it as a, a kind of aspect of human society in which people meet together in order to discuss the world around them in its various forms and types and concepts without being always pressured from outside in order to have an agenda or to deal with things from some other influencing body's viewpoint. Where do we get the chance to do that these days? Well, people will say, well, what about the internet? Well, the internet is dominated by very big corporations. We don't really get a chance to talk about things without the influence of Facebook's advertising, YouTube's monetarization, Google's search al algorithms, etc., and all the other commercial interests of, of the large corporations that are constantly and constantly influences, influencing us. Even the software we're using in the end of the day is not objectively uninfluencing. It, it, the very nature of the corporations that invented it produced the situations where our discussions that we have within the internet are influenced by these systems. Organizations themselves have a fear of debate that they don't have a handle on. One of the organizations I work for has a great problem with <laughs> with people talking without a member of staff being present. About people being able to make decisions in their own interests and in the wider interests of both the organisation and society as a whole without constantly being tugged back to an agenda that the organisation itself has. We need to preserve the opportunities for engaging with the public sphere. I shall give you an example. I teach two courses, called, one called Great Thinkers and the other one called Big Ideas. Um, I consider these to be quintessentially public sphere courses. They're not really courses in the sense that they have clear-cut aims and objectives. In fact, I try to avoid those. I try to create what, I, what you might call transient uh, objectives. That is to say, these are objectives that come into being as the needs of the student participants are, are exemplified in the work and then disappear again later on and are replaced by others. In other words, we move from need to need as time goes on. And the process of doing that is a much more organic approach to the way in which learning is supposed to operate. We, what we don't have is this preset instrumentalist and managerialist approach which says, uh, this is the, oh, this is the uh, learning outcome you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have it for this course. Uh, have you achieved it or not? And if you haven't achieved it, you haven't really learned, have you? Uh, which is part and parcel of the accounting process that funding bodies need. And again, another managerialist boy. What we have to do is avoid that. In other words, preserve within an organization the opportunity for this transient evolve, evolution of, 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 of devo evolving towards satisfaction of needs in the process of the work itself. And diminishing the role of the tutor within the, within, the, within the group. So the tutor's role is to serve the group rather than to lead them somewhere. In other words, the, 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 the tutor takes on a much more facilitational role, helping to make things happen, rather than the business of saying, this is what we're supposed to learn and this is how we're supposed to learn it. That is a very old idea. This goes back to the work of Paulo Freire. This goes back farther than that. It goes back to the, to, to the kind of pragmatic revolutionary concepts that that, that uh, John Dewey came up with very early on, the idea of the practical business of learning. Um, but what I'm suggesting is this is about preservation of an area which is avoids the business of being constantly influenced by outside forces, takes the commercialism out of it, and enables people to have this sense of being able to sit down and talk with one another and evolve ideas which will provide a f groundswell of information and, and concepts which feeds into the body politic of the local environment, the local community, and the nation of a, as a whole. I think that's really useful. And I think it also gives purpose, for instance, for instance, to the work the WBA does, provided the WBA was willing to take it on board. The idea of dumping its managerialism, dumping its sense of, in, of its own preservational importance, and looking towards the business of the public sphere as the idealized concept of, of learning with its facilitational process, uh, enabling individuals to gain knowledge, to gain experience, to gain practice, to gain, to gain praxis, 
as well, to, in a sense, gain a handle, a philosophical handle on the world. If we can do that, then the public sphere can grow, and I think it's, it's, could be essential to a, 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 a more politically informed society. Finally, and I think probably one of the most important aspects of the lot, is my views are very Kantian in terms of my attitudes to other human beings. Kant believed, asserted, concluded, that we should treat other human beings as ends and not as means to an end. We should treat other human beings as valuable in their own right, as individuals and as representatives of their community, their culture, their gender, their sense of self. Value them for who they are. Once we take that on board, then it has direct implications to our activities with regard to the business of rights within society. If you understand the business of treating people as ends and not means, then it implies also that rights are not something which is just the business of protecting certain groups against other groups, but in fact giving society as a whole a degree of protection from its own worst aspects, as you might say. Supporting the rights of small groups, of minority groups, whether they be racial groups, you know, black people, or, 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 or sexuality-related groups, gay people, or gender-related groups, transgender people like myself, it's not just protecting their rights, because once you protect their rights and recognize their rights, your rights are also, even though you're not a member of that group, are also protected too. Your rights, rights, sorry, rights are not divisible. They don't suddenly get separated out into small pockets, as you might say, which some people have and other people haven't. If that was the case, what we would have, as, as a colleague so rightly said, we would have privilege and not right. Rights are indivisible. And if rights are indivisible, then the ends of human beings in their own sense of, of their own value become valuable and universal to all of us. Think about that. That's ten points. I'm going to stop the video now and stop, rant, stop ranting. I'm going to put my tutor hat back on. Take this one off. Put the other one up. Tutor hat. And go back to my old job because I've got a, another piece of video teaching to do in a second. This was from me to reiterate. If you you know if you missed the bit at the start, this is me talking outside of my job, and just as a as a as a solitary individual who has access to ground and attitudes and a sense of an agenda and so on and so forth. You probably guessed that much of I what I've said earlier on was just stuff I've said in other contexts in conversations with you and with other human beings human beings, other people on, on, on other occasions. Maybe I've even mentioned them in classes and, 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 and the process try to play down my <laughs> my various commitments. I've certainly made these comments on, on you know my various postings to Facebook and, and other forums so it's not particularly unusual. But I need to put an end to that right now and go and, and say, you know, if you want to talk, me to talk more about this, please drop me a line via my website, www.begroves.net, B-E-A-G-R-O-V-E-S dot N-E-T, it's not dot com, it's dot net, uh, www.begroves.net. There is a page which allows you to send me a message. Um, be polite, be nice, or I shall come back to you and, s and camp outside your door. <laughs> but otherwise, um, I hope you found this interesting, stimulating, provocative, annoying, yeah, whatever. Have a good week. Have a safe week. Um, my love and greetings to everyone who's reading and listening and watching this. Thank you. Bye-bye for now.